Thank you all for joining us during this busy week for a critical conversation on how to counter COVID-19 shocks in fragile contexts. I'm Catherine Cheney, a senior reporter for DevEx, which is a media platform focused on global development. The COVID-19 pandemic has no doubt changed all of our lives as we dial in from around the world for this virtual Sustainable Development Impact Summit. But as we all know, and what brings you here today, this crisis is having an outsized impact on vulnerable populations. Before I introduce our panelists, I'm thrilled to welcome Professor Klaus Schwab, founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, for some introductory remarks. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, the title of this session is Countering COVID-19 Shocks in Fragile Context. And we all are aware that uh, shocks pose a significant um, threat to peace, stability, and achieving actually sustainable development goals. And if you look at the figures, it's shocking in itself because um, almost 2 billion people live in social and economic systems. COVID may act as an amplifier of this situation. And uh, COVID is taking a, a heavy toll on the most vulnerable people, on those people who have been most left behind. Um, we have a fantastic, uh, if I may say so, um, panel to discuss the issues and uh, to see what actions we can take in this, uh, very, um, at this very delicate moment of time. The World Economic Forum is very much involved now mobilizing all its stakeholders behind the so-called Greece set initiatives, which means to formulate, to use this window of opportunity to formulate um, policies, policies and uh, action-oriented ideas uh, to make the world in the post-corona era more um, uh, sustainable, more cohesive, and also more resilient. And of course, humanitarian and um, uh, humanitarian resilience uh, plays here a big role. And I'm very proud that we are here joined by the members of the Humanitarian Resilience Investing Initiative um, and the forum uh, which, which was created in order to unlock investor capital in fragile context. And in this regard, I would like to thank um, uh, Minister Sigrid Karg, who is co-chairing this initiative, as well as um, Filippo Grande, uh, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, and Catherine uh, Garrett Cox. You, as a business member, you have taken a particularly active role in those matters. Um, I also would like to thank Minister Abadi and particularly also Peter Lockham and the Hilton Foundation, because we have, uh, as I have just mentioned, a great uh, cooperation uh, in this area. So I'm looking forward to a very, uh, not only interesting, but hopefully um, action-oriented discussion. Uh, back to you, Katrin. Thank you so much, Professor Schwab. And I to look forward to an action-oriented discussion. Uh, you mentioned the Humanitarian Investment Initiative, which we'll be speaking about. Um, and I'm always thrilled when a conversation like this is set up to be not just about the issue, but ways to get involved. And I'm grateful that our panelists are actively involved in solving problems when it comes to countering these COVID-19 shocks and there are actual ways for our participants to get involved. So we'll speak to some of those. Just to build on a couple of the concerning facts and figures that Professor Schwab mentioned. Uh, World Bank projections look to 70 million people potentially sliding into extreme poverty this year as a result of COVID-19 and its socioeconomic ripple effects. And this would be the first increase in global poverty since 1998. Uh, there's also the expectation that 2 million preventable deaths could occur due to health disruptions caused by COVID-19. And for displaced and conflict affected people, the economic impact of this pandemic is really creating several additional crises, hunger, education, homelessness. I wanted to quickly cite some new uh, data I received this week from the Norwegian Refugee Council. Uh, so they surveyed 1,400 people across 14 countries, um, 1,400 people who are 
displaced. Um, and if you really think about this on an individual level, 77% of those surveyed had lost a job or income from work. 73% said they were less likely to send their children to school due to the economic hardship. And this one really struck me. 70% of those surveyed say they had to cut the number of meals for their household since the start of the pandemic. So if you just think about this on an individual level and then scale it up to the numbers we're talking about, um, it's, it's grim. And today we're gonna talk about the situation on the ground as well as what can be done about it, real opportunities for action. Um, how do we counteract what's really a downward spiral, just compounding other challenges for refugees and displaced people. Uh, we're gonna talk about how governments, investors, humanitarian and development actors can with real urgency in what Professor Schwab described as this delicate moment come together and build resilience for future shocks as well. So I'd love to begin with Filippo Grandi, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. And you've framed it as COVID-19 being an emergency on top of many other emergencies. So can you tell us what you mean by that and a little bit more about the real impact you're seeing of COVID-19 on refugees? Thank you, Catherine, and thank you, Klaus, for this initiative. Uh, I, um, you know, it may seem always that talking about refugees is a very niche issue. It's a small group of people, although, of course, there's almost 80 million of them between refugees and displaced around the world, but certainly they represent only a fraction of the total number of vulnerable people that are uh, impacted in different ways by COVID. But I think it is quite illustrative to talk about refugees because the impact on them exemplifies very much what happens to others. From the health point of view, um, refugees, interestingly, are not particularly more exposed than other groups. We haven't seen, surprisingly perhaps, any major outbreak even in very crowded refugee camps. It may still happen. This pandemic is very unpredictable, but we haven't, we haven't uh, seen it. So the hazards to which refugees are exposed are similar to others and requiring, by the way, the same responses and the same prevention, including eventually inclusion in vaccine distribution, which may be a little bit more complicated. But what, where the risk, and you've already mentioned, Catherine, where the risk is higher, perhaps, is poverty, is sudden, greater, and protracted poverty. And you've given some statistics from the Norwegian Refugee Council. Basically, most of those 80 million people depend on jobs or other forms of livelihoods that are the first ones that disappear in lockdowns. We've seen it all across South America with the 5 million Venezuelans. We've seen it in African cities that host many refugees. We've seen it in Southwest Asia, in the areas hosting Afghan refugees, quite dramatic already. And the risk is, of course, that as states and international institutions put in place safety nets, rescue packages, for political reasons, some of these groups are left out. And that's been my strongest message from the IMF to bilateral governments who are trying to put together these packages. If very quickly, two, more, two three more points. One, education. Education, very important. You mentioned it already. We, we've worked with the Malala Foundation. I've been quoting this a lot. 50% of the girls that have are out of school now because schools are closed are unlikely to go back to school because meanwhile poverty has taken the toll and for girls that means early marriage exploitation and worse and uh, I've seen it. I was in Lebanon a few days ago. I spoke to many refugee families. They said, we're sorry, we cannot send our kids back to school and we need to marry our girl because that's, that's the only way out of poverty. And the other big area that we need to be worried about is a bit less tangible, is the protection area. Closed borders, out of necessity, push out, keep out people that need to cross those borders because it's vital for them. And that is something we've been focusing a lot. And of course, other more social aspects of protection. SGBV has skyrocketed in some areas with, uh, with uh, lockdowns and stigma grows in situation of pandemic. We've seen it throughout Ebola and we've already seen it now. 
very easy scapegoat, refugees, displaced, migrants, foreigners, so something to watch as well. Thank you so much. And we're going to return to our panelists um, to have a conversation after we hear from each of them. But I do want to encourage our attendees uh, to go ahead and submit questions as you have them throughout. So if you wanted to build directly on um, what you just heard, or if you have questions coming up, um, you can use the Slido app, which you should see now on your screens, um, to ask questions. We'd love to incorporate your thoughts and questions into the conversation. Um, so we've heard uh, a little bit about the, the situation on the ground and the urgency for action. Um, also really thrilled to have Wissam Rabadi, Jordan's Minister of Planning and International Cooperation joining us. And I'm wondering if you can build on what we've just heard in terms of the socioeconomic impacts of COVID-19 on these populations, um, as well as what's ahead. I mean, I know it's such an unpredictable time, but based on the trends that you're seeing, what can we expect in the next six to 12 months? And, and the way I often see this framed is, here's what we can expect if we act, and here's what we can expect if we don't act. And so just to frame the urgency of this, what can we expect um, in those two scenarios? Oh, and I apologize, you are on mute. There we go. Okay, thanks, Catherine. And, and thanks, Klaus, for, for, uh, for organizing this. Uh, let, let me quickly just say that, uh, uh, you know, Jordan is no stranger for shocks. Uh, we have been living in external shocks for over 10 years now, uh, uh, continuous shocks, starting in 2009 <clears throat> in the global financial crisis, followed by the Arab Spring and all its implication, then terrorism and ISIS and closing borders with neighboring countries, uh, to the Syrian crisis and 1.3 million refugees coming to Jordan, making Jordan a home for 3.6 million refugees. For a country that is 10 million in population, that's 36% of our country is, is refugees. So, uh, and now COVID. So, so that uh, apparently uh, had a, a severe, the COVID has a severe if, uh, impact on, uh, on, on refugees in, in terms of, uh, of their income, in terms of their access to education, in, 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 many, uh, in many issues on the refugee uh, community. But, but what I wanted, the interesting and scary observation uh, is according to a UNICEF um, uh, uh, study on socioeconomic assessment of children and youth uh, uh, after COVID, uh, we've noticed that actually a uh, hosting community, hosting community of Jordanians is really now being exposed to a, a, a similar, almost a similar vulnerabilities. Uh, so the study shows that, you know, similar levels of engagement in economic opportunities between Syrians and Jordanians before and after lockdown are very similar in percentages. Uh, about, you know, 23% of Syrians are engaged in uh, searching for a job. It's 25% for Jordanians. Uh, the same for uh, accessing uh, government online learning. Uh, uh, where we see very similar uh, uh, percentages. Uh, the difference is, though, is that the study shows that 88% uh, of Syrian households are receiving social assistance uh, through all our friends and, and, and the UN organizations and, and the donor community, uh, while only 35% uh, of Jordanian households uh, uh, are, are receiving that kind of social uh, assistance. So, the, you know, the fear today in Jordan is that we have the hosting communities is going the way the refugees are going. So it, it, they're vulnerable and uh, we need to act quickly uh, with our partner and the international community uh, to really not to forget that there is a crisis here on the ground before COVID. Uh, and now with COVID, and I understand the of global recession and, and aid coming down, and we can talk about this later, but, uh, but also there has been a crisis in Jordan on the ground with the Syrian crisis, and this, could, this uh, crisis is only worsening now, and including Jordanian. Exactly, it's back to that point of uh, an emergency on top of other emergencies. And as you mentioned, um, even with this, aid funding is expected to go down, and those donor commitments that do exist are really prioritizing the health response over the socioeconomic impacts that we're discussing today. So um, kind of transitioning now from what you're seeing on the ground and the challenges to opportunities for action and how we drive more dollars to these contexts. 
I'd like to turn to Sigrid Kog, the Minister for Foreign Trade and Development Cooperation for the Netherlands. I'd love to hear from you how partners might respond. Earlier, uh, Professor Schwab mentioned the Humanitarian Investment Initiative launched with the World Economic Forum and you were a key partner there. So can you tell us a little bit more about how this initiative has been operating over the past six months and what more is really needed to bring leaders together and, and drive more support for not just the health impacts of COVID-19, but the socioeconomic impacts we're discussing today. Yep, sorry. Thank you very much. And thanks again for calling together this important panel. I'd like to make three remarks and then I'll come to the humanitarian initiative. Uh, first of all, I recognize very much what Filippo uh, was mentioning in terms of the the impact of COVID-19, of course, uh, uh, as an amplifier of disaster in a way on already vulnerable populations, in particular, of course, migrants uh, internally displaced or, uh, or the refugees. But it basically applies to anyone who is without a job, without status, poor, an informal worker. Uh, and of course, we see that, that, that triple whammy uh, of loss and impact on the most vulnerable. And this, I think, is where both our humanitarian assistance programs as, as partner countries and our development programming actually need, need to be reset as well, because our mechanisms and system work to an extent. But of course, not having foreseen any one of us, the pandemic and its impact in this way, we are not geared, I think, to respond to deal with the long term consequences. So a number of conversations are happening. And I think and in this regard, we need to, to tackle and see where we can be more agile, more flexible, and potentially also recalibrate funding that would traditionally be consist, um, considered so-called development financing to give that a development minus, but a humanitarian plus outlook. This is also a way to sort of stop uh, talking uh, from a divide perspective as if there are separate ways. There's one human being, they're usually in one country or one place where they live, and they need a multi multitude of channels of support uh, and protection. And I think it's up on donor countries, but also the bank, as well as the IMF, to really look at the macro level, as well as find the appropriate response mechanisms. Secondly, we need to work a lot more local. And this is the so-called globalization debate on which I've, I've led uh, as the so-called, I'm saying so-called eminent person, but that's the job title, uh, with, within the humanitarian system but we're finding it very hard to make traction. And partly because the system itself is as resilient as donor countries may sometimes be. We need to work much faster and better, uh, UN agencies included through local actors and partners. But we need to accept the risk. And in COVID-19 times where there's neither access nor oversight, trust is a big pillar in this entire equation of our ability to reach those who need it the most. And we need to accept the risk that comes with it, both fiduciary risks to some extent, but also the political and reputational risk. And we're working with the ICRC uh, on risk sharing. The real question you've asked, how is the humanitarian financing initiative uh, making progress? Uh, it's working very hard on the pipeline of proposals, but I was just checking with my staff as well. It's a little bit frustrating to see that our entire collective finds it quite hard to sort of fill the pipeline, that investors, private sector investors, banks, and other individuals that are looking for new ways to finance and invest, because it is an investment in human capital uh, and investing in a protection agenda, that the pipeline of proposals itself is slower than anticipated. So unfortunately, the initiative itself has not been the panacea to deal with the additionality of needs. And I think that's a call upon all of us, and I'm doing the, using this platform too now, to invite everyone to submit proposals uh, so we can really sort of do things differently as I outlined. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and speaking of this private sector interest, growing private sector interest in these markets, um, and perhaps Catherine, you can build on this challenge with the pipeline of proposals. I'd like to bring in Catherine Garrett Cox. So she's the chief executive officer for Gulf International Bank. And you've been working on ways to drive more financing to fragile contexts. I'm sure this initiative we've just heard of is only one way you're doing that. And I'd love to hear um, how, how it's going, but what the real challenges are. And, and if you can expand on this challenge of the pipeline of proposals, we'd love to hear your thoughts on that too. Thank you, Catherine. And again, thank you to Professor Schwab for bringing us all together and for really shining a light on this critical topic. I think um, the first thing that I would say is this is not easy. I think if it was easy, 
it would have been done already. And I think to the point that the minister just made, uh, some of the aspects of how we bring together all of the different actors that need to convene on these areas of extreme importance are absolutely critical. So I think the first thing is that traditionally the private sector has seen humanitarian crises and issues as something that pertains much more to the charitable sector. And, and clearly that just isn't the case. The big hurdle as we see it, and this has been a, a huge part of our focus within the humanitarian investing initiative, has been frankly the lack of data that really enables investors to look into these issues and to be able to make the right assessments. And I think if you perhaps draw a parallel to the challenges around original data and data gathering on climate change, we should learn a lot from what's happened with Mark Carney's TCFD initiative. And from a standing start of really nowhere a few years ago, we're now up to around 1400 organizations who've committed to disclosing climate change data representing around $12.5 trillion. So there's an example of success and I think that what we now need to be able to do is to really turn it inward and look at the societal issues. Because I do find it ironic that it's taken a tragic global pandemic, which really enforces isolation, to bring us closer together as communities across the world. And this idea that we're all in it, SDG 17 is all about partnership. I think is absolutely fundamental. And I think to, to the point about uh, you know, the, the, the minister's sort of challenge, we need to crowd more enlightened people into this space. And uh, therefore we can truly find the right solutions. But for us, the top priority right now is establishing the data that will enable those investors who are absolutely ready to step up to the plate to play their part in solving this and creating solutions. Thank you, Catherine. So we've heard about some of the challenges when it comes to aid and the need for a reset. We've heard a little bit about the role of the private sector. And now I'd like to turn it over to Peter Laharn, who's the CEO of the Conrad Hilton Foundation out here on the west coast of the US, to talk with us a little bit more about the role that philanthropy can play. And Peter, if you can speak to not just the role the philanthropy, that philanthropy can play in this short term in crisis mode to help these communities um, but also how to help these communities in the long term, the long term recovery and maybe um, better practices for the future. Sure. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, what a great panel and what an important topic. Uh, our, our mission at the Hilton Foundation is improving the lives of the disadvantaged around the world. And so this is day in, day out work as for other members of the panel. Uh, we work half domestic, half international. So I'd like to go a little bit off script from World Economic Forum and talk domestic United States here, uh, because there have been shocks here as well that I think are illustrative. In my hometown, our hometown of Los Angeles, uh, we've been greatly hit by, by COVID. It has been racially inequitable. And our, our homelessness crisis has gone from something that was just barely managed to something that now threatens half a million households. Uh, so I think it, not only in, in, in the global south, but all over, we need to be looking at these things. And I think uh, what we need to be looking at is effective multi-stakeholder partnerships. I think this panel is a good example. Government, uh, including uh, um, intergovernmental organizations, business, civil society, and, and philanthropy. Uh, the, I think we can look at fragility in a different perspective when we look at multi-stakeholder partnerships, because it's not all of it that is fragile. There are weak links and there are strong links. We've seen this in, in Jordan as a tremendous strong link. And I think Catherine has, and Minister Koch have just given a great idea of what business and investment in humanitarian could be. But we need better coordination. We see that in Los Angeles. We see that in, in the humanitarian system. We need to recommit to the frameworks that we already have, SDGs, Paris, Global Compact on Refugees, and not let the present day fatigue us so that we forget them. Uh, we need to make them stronger. Uh, we need to include more people, and particularly those who are affected. Uh, the 70 million people that, uh, that you spoke of, Catherine, are people of agency, dignity, ideas, aspirations, and they're not involved. Uh, and, so, and I'd really like to laud the World Economic Forum this year for bringing so many more voices into this summit. And I think that's extremely important. They should be at the table, not just to hear what is said, but to contribute uh, and, and to really work on those problems. One last thing, uh, I really support 
uh, the localization uh, push from, from HCR, from Minister Kach, from Catherine, and we can do this. We can move this farther. And the, the Hilton Foundation commits to doing its part, organizing philanthropy to, to do that. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you, Peter. And thank you for mentioning the local angle. Um, I'd like to bring up a follow-up question and I see we have some great questions coming in, so keep them coming and I will get to them. Um, but making sure that we talk about um, the most vulnerable, you mentioned some of the most vulnerable in Los Angeles and I'm so glad you did. I also wanna talk about internally displaced people. We've talked about refugees, um, but in certain contexts, earlier Venezuela came up, um, people are facing some of the same problems, but there aren't some of the same mechanisms to support them. So I wonder if any of the speakers can speak to that challenge and what's being done. Commissioner Grandi, is that something you might be able to speak to or, or um, Minister Rabadi? You unmute me? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, when I, uh, when I describe the challenges on, on refugees, replying to your first question, I really encompassed all. Of course, there's differences because internally displaced people are citizens. Mm -hmm. So paradoxically, well, not paradoxically, you, you may think that if the challenge at one point will be exclusion versus inclusion, they may have a better chance to be included in whatever responses, economic, social, vaccines, than people like refugees that are non-citizens or not citizens of that particular country. But that's a bit of a technical point because in reality, we, we know very well that another big challenge that exists and COVID has exasperated it is the dichotomy between, for example, in some poorer countries between the capital and the rest of the country. And I think that that is something that we've been talking to the COVAX group of organizations when you know, it's, it's not just enough to say vaccines will have to be distributed to all countries, but within each country, there has to be an equitable distribution. Displaced people very often, almost always, will be outside these, these more privileged areas, let's call them like this. And I think that this needs to be taken into account. I, if I can make another point on displaced people that is very dear to me, you know, this internal displacement and this transcends COVID, but is exacerbated by COVID. In many countries, Colombia, Afghanistan, Somalia, you name it, is becoming in reality an urbanization phenomenon. Internally displaced people in those countries will not go back mostly to where they come from, which is essentially rural areas. They go to mid-sized towns, sometimes even to capitals, but mostly mid-sized towns. So it is important in planning for the post-COVID and the rehabilitation of all this to take into account that some planning assumption will have to change because the situation has changed due to the shocks that we have seen. COVID in the short term or more recently, but behind that, you know, years of conflict and other drivers of displacement and in particular internal displacement. Thank you so much. And I'm really glad we got to that point of um, thinking not just about countries where there is need and getting dollars to those countries, but actually getting um, financing to the people in need. So thank you so much. Um, so we have a question coming in. Um, I'm going to direct to Minister Cog, if that's all right. Um, there's a question on um, kind of building on your point about the localization agenda. And the question is, um, due to COVID humanitarian response, um, we, we need to rely more on local civil society actors. How are the panelists investing in local action and sharing power? This is from someone at Women Deliver. So um, investing in local action and sharing power, what does that look like and what more is needed? And we'll start with Minister Cog. And if others want to jump in, I'm happy to take other perspectives as well. Well, um, even pr uh, prior to COVID, of course, uh, the international community is still finding it harder than they should to invest in the localization agenda. It's simply not happening fast enough. And as you know from the grand bargain, we've set targets and we need to measure and we need to ensure that this is happening. On the other side, if one considers it, particularly from the global south, uh, we really need to, uh, to uh, delegate the authority decision-making prioritization really to the partners from the global south. So this means, this means also a reset 
I believe in many of the partnerships either funded by governments or supported by international uh, NGOs. And I think we're all in this together. This is the spirit of the grand bargain, but also the reality of uh, enhanced delivery. What's happened since COVID, we've seen very little traction, partly because uh, the space uh, has been shrinking uh, increasingly for a lot of civil society organizations and international partners have, find, have been finding it very hard to create access when it was needed. But I think now is a, a time to be even more vigilant uh, because we cannot allow this new status quo to be the new norm. This is both politically not wise and I think in terms of effective delivery and results for the people that need this, this the support is not desirable either. So I've just, uh, and from my side, by way of example, I've just had a meeting uh, earlier today with a number of uh, Dutch international NGOs and Oxfam to discuss how we can actually make this happen. So my invitation to a number of the people perhaps on this call would also to let us know where you think the missing links are beyond obviously the political will, the financing instruments. What is not happening that we can actually fix quicker because there is an opportunity in this tremendous crisis or rather there's a duty in this crisis. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd love to go to Peter now to build on that. Thanks. Um, entirely in agreement. Uh, and um, I think we should also encourage philanthropy to, uh, to move its funding as much as possible close to those who are affected. Uh, in my previous role, uh, before Hilton Foundation, I, I uh, ran a foundation that made thousands of grants to African CBOs that never qualified for USAID funding. And, and I, I, I have great confidence in uh, philanthropy's ability to do this and to serve as angel investors in a value chain that works up uh, to the way that Minister Kah is talking about. Also voices to the table, Let, let's make sure affected people are here. And think about them as active parts of multi-stakeholder simply, if you like, props or, or moving descriptions, but really actors along with us. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. And I know um, actually just this morning, I was reading about the role of Catholic sisters in the COVID-19 response, which I know is a key priority for the Hilton Foundation and one way to reach these communities. Um, Catherine, did you wanna jump in on, on the same point? I, I really wanted to just say that um... Uh, COVID has brought fragility to communities that you never really would have imagined would suffer. So even in central London, where GIB asset management is based, we ran into a situation where some of the local schools were very, very hard pressed because their uh, children, many of whom uh, received free school meals, didn't have access to basic computers to be able to do their remote schooling. So we turned our, you know, we were very much looking inward to make sure that our people were safe and protected. And then we looked outward as an organization and we effectively donated around 40 to 50 laptops to some of the, of, of the most sort of urgent schools that needed it so that some of their secondary uh, school children could actually complete their studies. And so I think, you know, the business sector just needs to be quite creative. Sometimes it's not just about helping to solve an issue around a displaced uh, refugee, for instance, but look in your own community and see what you can do and do something practically useful. Thank you, Catherine. And Minister Abadi, I believe you wanted to build on this as well. Uh, uh, yes, Catherine. I, I, I think what Catherine and, and Peter just uh, alluded to, look, uh, uh, you know, we're, we, we're, we, we realize that uh, this global recession is resulting, uh, resulting from this pandemic is likely to drive significant reduction in official development aid and assistance, which is extremely alarming. We have the Jordan response plan for the Syrian crisis that uh, up to today, only 25 or 26 percent of that plan, uh, which is a mechanism to support refugee and hosting communities, uh, is only funded, which means, uh, you know, funding is going, uh, is going down. I, I think we really have to, um, you know, uh, realize that we're on this together and none of us is safe until we are all safe. Uh, and the whole concept of shared prosperity and shared values, uh, building uh, uh, partnerships and uh, uh, with the private sector, particularly with the private sector, uh, beyond just philanthropy and, and, and corporate social responsibility. I think this needs to come in a shared prosperity, part of the value and part of the business model 
of uh, uh, corporations and, and businesses around the world. Uh, and, and that is uh, really what, uh, what will help us all to get, uh, to, get to a more fair, uh, a more inclusive, and hopefully more sustainable uh, future. So it's really in our hands to shape that post-COVID uh, uh, future. And I think the private sector definitely uh, can play a, a significant role in, in, in that aspect. Great, and we have um, just a few minutes left, so please keep questions coming. Um, I wanted to see, did any of our participants want to jump in? I'm sorry, did any of our panelists want to jump in and I missed you? Professor Schwab, I couldn't tell if you were raising your finger for no, me no, or no, no, no. Okay, yes, Professor Schwab. I just want to toss your attention to the social entrepreneurs. Uh, we just created at the World Economic Forum a global platform integrating uh, all organizations which um, uh, deal with social entrepreneurs. We, we have now about 50,000 so social entrepreneurs. They are such formidable, let's say, implementers on a local level, but they are running out of support. So there is a great community which could be very helpful on the local local level, but we should pay more attention to those people. I totally agree. I'm working on a story on that very topic. So mm -hmm. thank you for bringing up that important point. Um, I have another question coming in and I think we have time probably to get to this question and then maybe have some concluding thoughts from our panelists. Um, there's a question around, let's see, um, Huh. This is from a global shaper. Speaking of um, social entrepreneurs, many of our global, uh, the West global shapers are social entrepreneurs. And here's the question. How can private and public sector actors bridge the rapidly widening gender gap at micro and macro levels to reverse damages from COVID and reset standards globally? So um, speaking of vulnerable populations, and this was mentioned earlier with gender-based violence, um, girls and women are disproportionately affected by many of these impacts of COVID um, and the socioeconomic impacts of COVID. So would any of our speakers love to jump in on this question when it relates to girls and women and the rapidly widening gender gap? And what can be done about it? Mr. Cog. Just very briefly, I think it's actually a, a symptom maybe of the times we're living in. So yes, the gap is widening, but COVID has also unfolded a, a prevailing and pre-existing gap and vulnerabilities. It's deepening, it's widening. So I think the, the, the quick answer, but the difficult response is that we need to act. Uh, all our efforts need, if they're not already gender marked and gender specific, they need to be so, they need to be benchmarked against it. You need to be held accountable. And of course, we need to look at what the new needs uh, of women and girls are. It's very clear that girls are dropping out of school that uh, if, uh, girl, uh, young um, prepubescent pregnancies are on the rise and, and, and. So the whole cycle of vulnerability is reinforced and we need to target, I think all our efforts, financial uh, governments and private sector, we need to target our, our efforts differently because we have a long way to go. Uh, the reversal of gains and, and the trajectory on the SDGs has been hit tremendously. And this is only the start of the impact of the crisis. And many countries will or are being hit by a second wave. So it is, it is almost intractable. But we, need, we, need, we do need to use the SDGs as our compass. And I think we need to really look at global impact investors to help us track a new, uh, uh, carve out a new uh, pa uh, pathway. Because it's through the additionality of impact investing, we may, may be able to make a dent in this tremendous uh, negative uh, outlook. So I find it very concerning, um, but if we're all in this together and our call also needs to be one of optimism and the ability to create, to withstand, to mitigate, but also adapt, help our societies adapt to come out stronger. It's not an easy call, but it's much needed. Thank you, Minister Cog. And with just five minutes left here, oh, um, yes, Commissioner Gandhi, go ahead. I'd love to hear your take on this. We can yeah. be brief in our concluding remarks. I'll be, very, I'll be very brief, just to say, you know, there's a lot of good practices that uh, we've been, some, some of us in the humanitarian community have been carrying out with a lot of help from many of you, including the WEF, you know, developing uh, better practices on access to financial services by 
vulnerable people or uh, supporting more targeted vocational training, even attracting investment in fragile situation. We've had some quite incredible experiences in Kenya, for example. Now, all of this can be, may I say, easily targeted at women, for example, by the private sector, because we do need the private sector to work with us on those good practices, small as it may be, because from small then comes big. And we need for this good government environments. This is why I'm, I'm happy with Sam is here, because this is why we can do so much innovative work in Jordan, because Jordan has opened up the space for us to do that. It's not the same in many other countries. In Lebanon, it has been, let's say it, much more difficult to do the same. So I think it's important to, to pull these elements together, but to also tell the private sector, there's a lot of grassroots work that we're doing in these areas with a lot of global thinking going into it, but in the end, it's the practice that makes a difference. Thank you so much for that. And I'd love to just quickly hear from each of our panelists. Let's think about hopefully being all together in New York this time next year. What needs to happen so that we'll look back and point to progress in this area? So right now we're talking about lots of very concerning challenges for these populations. We have calls to action. We have ways to get involved. A year from now, when we're hopefully together in New York at the Sustainable Development Impact Summit, what needs to happen for us to point to some progress? And I'll look to which panelist wants to jump in first. Hope to hear from all of you very briefly. What needs to happen in the next year? Catherine. So very briefly, I think we've heard it. We need to mobilize capital. And so I think the ask is if you're in a corporate, put this topic of data and how we build it onto your corporate agenda. If you're an investor, ask the companies you're investing in where it is. And together, I'm truly confident that we can achieve a mission of building a better data set to support those who are most vulnerable in society. Thank you. We'd love, we'd like to jump in next year. Minister Cog. Yeah, um, maybe beyond the humanitarian initiative, but a vaccine that is equi equitably shared and distributed to the most vulnerable. So we're not just in vac uh, providing vaccines to, to the West. I think it, it's the weakest uh, link. Secondly, debt restructuring, possibly debt forgiveness, given the fact that many countries are about to, on the verge of collapse. Uh, and thirdly, of course, additional financing uh, for, for, the, for, the new emerge, for the emerging needs and the structural needs. And, and fourthly, political will, not being scared in an era of populism and looking only within one's borders to really advocate very proudly for international solidarity and humanity. Thank you, Mr. Cog. Peter. Um, well, three, I, I'd like to talk to the listeners who are here today. Three things that you can do in the next year. One, don't let COVID cloud your long haul vision. Recommit to frameworks and COVID proof them. Okay. Two, enhance coordination wherever you're working and help those in authority and accountability do their job better, make sure to bring in those, those affected by problems into their solutions. And three, work on localization. If you have resource flows, move them closer to those who are affected. Thanks. Thank you, Peter, appreciate that. Yes, Commissioner Gandhi. Yeah, I'll be very simple here. Two things, I think. There's, there's been some amazing debate around or within the COVID discussion on how we, we work together globally, but we haven't seen it in practice yet. So unless that international cooperation, which by the way, is one of the main findings of the consultations that the UN has run for the 75th uh, anniversary, you know, people saying, where's this international cooperation? It, unless that happens, we will, not, we will not make progress in a year's time. And if I may say, and if I can be completely simple in my message, the rich have to, be, have, to be, have to do more for the poor. This is exactly what Sigrid said. It's the same thing. Unless the rich do more for the poor, and we have not seen it yet, unless we haven't heard, we don't hear this message through COVID, we miss a big chance and the poverty that will emerge will be profoundly destabilizing for the rich as well, by the way. Powerful call to action, and hopefully we see progress there over the next year. Minister Rabadi, we'll close with you and, and then wrap up. Uh, yes, I, 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 I was going to echo what uh, what Filippo said. I think uh, 
you know, we, we really need a, fa a more fair, more inclusive world. Uh, you know, this, uh, this crisis have exposed uh, our, uh, the world we live in and, and uh, the inequality and uh, uh, we, need, we need more sustainability in, in this world. I mean, this is one crisis. I don't know if climate change is going to be the next hit in, in this world and, and we need to be ready. And this, uh, the world, there is need to be solidarity uh, in, in this world because we share this planet together. And uh, we, we, we had rich and, and, and poor and corporate, private sector, public sector need to come together. As a Minister of International Cooperation, I would love to see more international cooperation based on solidarity and, uh, and, and based on common vision. Thank you. And I just want to echo something you said earlier when you mentioned none of us are safe unless we're all safe. And uh, a dynamic that's been coming up in some of the World Economic Forum sessions I participated in this week is this is a moment where we're all affected by COVID. So there's this sense of urgency. And we need to make sure that even as, as one speaker had put it in a previous session, even when we're sorted, um, we don't move on. We consider populations who still remain in crisis due to COVID-19. Um, also, I, I loved uh, the point you made when it comes to climate change. Our task today is to talk about countering COVID-19 shocks and building resilience for future shocks, climate change, um, being very much a present crisis and something that will only grow worse in the future. Um, so a lot of the models for collaboration we talked about today will be critical in responding to COVID, but also in preparing for encountering future shocks. Uh, so we're at time. I want to thank all of our panelists for joining us and sharing their expertise. Thank you to Professor Schwab for um, joining us today and to the World Economic Forum team for putting this together.